So here we are talking about economics. So price of material is another sort of type of material property. It's economic property, I suppose. Uh, and it's very, very crucial in, in sort of figuring out whether you're gonna use material for process. Um, and sometimes we have really good materials, but we can't use them because of the cost. So you can see this kid here uh, in this picture. It's a very good example. I mean, it's a joke, but uh, I have, um, he's, he's selling lemonade uh, and he wants $500 a glass. And you know what? He's right because he's getting Italian imported lemons that he's self, self squeezing um, and it's taking him time and it's very expensive to buy these things. Uh, and so to make these lemonade, uh, to make this lemonade cup it takes him a lot of money and a lot of effort. And so he wants to offset that by having some revenue. But no one's going to buy a lemonade for $500 a glass because you can buy it for much more than that, for a quarter cup, right? Uh, with non Italian imported lemons. So you really have to think about what the starting materials are. Are they worth it for the price markup? And are people going to pay for it? So different uh, materials have different prices, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, and you could see here. Platinum and diamonds, they're usually up in, in, the, in the upper range of material uh, of, uh, of uh, prices, uh, whereas uh, cement and coal are in the lower range of these things. Uh, but these are adapted from, uh, from a book, uh, and they're not necessarily current, uh, they're from 2012. And you, could, you can go and get up-to-date material uh, prices from the Wall Street Journal and from the London Metal Exchange uh, website, lme.com, uh, to find out what it is today. Uh, and they change as you as you'll see daily. They're not constant. So the price of gold uh, varied tremendously uh, between 2010 and 2013, which is on the right. Uh, you can see it had increase a sharp increase in 2011, and then it, and then it sort of leveled off now uh, towards 2013. And if you look at the price of gold from 2000, it it, it went six times in price uh, between 2000 and 2011. So you cannot necessarily rely on certain uh, ingredients uh, when you're making the material. And the way companies deal with this, uh, th let's say uh, gold is very important for a company to use, and they're using that as a constant source of, uh, of material for their process, um, it's very volatile. So what they'll do is they'll engage in a thing called future contract, where they buy this material at a current market price, and uh, they buy it for a projected amount of time, let's say four or five years. And they think it's, it's a gamble because what if the price goes down? As you can see, gold went down in 2013. So let's say I bought at the price right before that sharp decrease, uh, as I'm gonna point to the mouse here. Let's say I bought it here, right? For the next four years. And then the next day it went down here, I'm losing a whole lot of money. But let's say I bought it here and then it went up. I am actually saving a lot of money. So depending on where it is and how it is that you're doing that, uh, this, this is, this is it's, 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 a, it's a way for this to happen. So I want you to uh, sort of propose, take a minute to propose this fluctuation in prices. Take a minute to think about to yourself why you think these prices might fluctuate.
So I've come up with some some uh, reasons of my own. So supply and demand, um, you know, if the supply is high, and if the supply is high and there's not a lot of it, someone will pay two hundred dollars for a couple of lemonades. So you can see in the picture down there. Uh, you know, in the middle of the Arizona desert, and you are stuck without water or lemonade, and you really you're gonna pay whatever it is you can to drink it. So uh, the rules of economics. So that's that's economic theory. That's not that's something that chemical engineers need to familiarize themselves with. Um, also, uh, I talked about cost of extraction. So we talked about diamonds earlier. How hard is it to extract uh, a material uh, out of, from the ground or from an ore or whatever uh, is going to very much dictate to me the uh, the price of the material. So let's say we ran out of oil in the world, uh, and the only oil is in the in the Mariana Trench. Uh, which is the deepest uh, point in the ocean in the world, and it's underneath that in, in the in the bed underneath that. So I have to now construct this uh, new drill is going to go down six mile underground, uh, six mile under the ocean, and then a few miles underground, get the oil out and pump it out back up. Uh, that's going to cost me a tremendous amount of money, and you bet the oil prices would be uh, who knows what a hundred dollars a gallon or something like that, only because the price to extract it. Is going to be very high, um, even if you can make it for the whole world out of Mariana Trench reserves. Uh, and again, it's a, a it's a product of availability, which I just just dis, dis, discussed. Um, how available is the material in the world? Uh, how many diamond ores are there? How many aluminum ores are there? Uh, how much are we using? Uh, uh, and and stuff like that. And uh, the price of transport. So you saw uh, back uh, a few years ago when the price of oil went up a lot. Uh, a lot of other things uh, were influenced by that. So, uh, if you, I don't know if you remember, but the cost of electricity also skyrocketed around that time. It had to do with because they are reliant on oil. Uh, and any uh, products in the supermarket, they also went up in price because now they have to transport, say, milk from the factory to uh, the store uh, using double the price for the transport cost because of the gas. Uh, so, it's another thing that might influence. Uh, the so now another another chart I want you to look at is the availability of different materials. How available are they in the world? So out of the Earth's crust, 47% of the crust is oxygen and 27% of it is silicon. Uh, surprising, but that that's true. The most abundant material on Earth on uh, in the ground is silicon, uh, and in the oceans, uh, it's oxygen, as you might imagine, because it's mostly water. Uh, and then uh, in the atmosphere, it would be nitrogen, uh, which you, you might know as well. Uh, and so you would imagine that uh, the more abundant that they, they are, the cheaper that they are uh, necessarily. But that's not always the case. As you can see uh, from the chart, titanium uh, accounts for 0.4% of the Earth's crust, whereas carbon is 0.02% of the Earth's crust. Right? But you think about um, what's more expensive. Titanium or carbon, uh, and you'll see titanium is much much more expensive. Even though according to this chart, it's twenty times more abundant. So why is that? Uh, that has to do with the idea of reserves and resources. So there are two things uh, you need to, just to understand about. Yes, I have these things available, but there are two things uh, that dictate how I will be able to extract it. I have reserves. That's how much I can extract out of the ground or out of the ocean or out of the atmosphere using today's technology. That's the reserves. And the resources are the amount that are available on Earth. So the chart I gave you a minute ago, that was the resources. So yes, titanium has uh, 20 times more resources than carbon. Doesn't mean that we can extract all of it. And let me give you an idea, of, uh, a, sort of an analogy to your own lifetime, okay? You have the potential to get out of school and make millions. You will likely make an average salary, right? So, so your resource is millions of dollars, but your reserve is probably an average salary, you know, high five figures, low six figures, that kind of thing. So to get the resource, you need to put a lot more money and a lot more uh, work a lot, a lot harder to get that out. And same idea works for uh, for materials. For me to get the resource, so I get more titanium, I need to put a lot more work to get out of the ground and, and, and extract it and use it and purify it. So. Just because I have a lot of it doesn't mean I can use it all. One last chart that influences the pricing is the price that we use when we extract it. So aluminum requires a lot of material, a lot of energy to extract, whereas 
um, oil a lot less and gravel even less than that. Uh, so that will definitely factor into the uh, the price of the material at the end of the day. Okay, so there's a lot of different things, and this, this is just touching upon the beginning of engineering economics, uh, but there's other things we need to understand as well uh, as chemical engineers, and you will take courses where they introduce you to things like that as well. So lastly, and this, this will drive our discussion when we meet for the office hours. Um, obviously, in the office hours, you can ask me any question you want, um, but I will probably be discussing this more in detail, uh, and this will also appear in your homework. You need to calculate the lifetime of a resource. So how long until this resource dies out and I can't use it anymore? So if I have the current consumption rate C, okay, uh, I, I can get I can get based on the consumption rate at time t equals zero. Let's say time equals zero is yesterday. Uh, that then t would be one day difference, right? Uh, I can get sort of how much I'm going to use today based on yesterday's data, okay? And then you have a factor there in the exponential r, which depends among other things on the population growth. It's the commodity rate, rate growth. Uh, and the commodity growth rate uh, depends on uh, population rate. And I'm giving you some examples here. Zimbabwe is the largest growing country in the world at 4.26%, where Syria is the lowest one at negative 9.73 because of the uh, civil war at the moment. And the United States is just around 1%. Uh, and that's definitely going to dictate to you the consumption rate for the consumers. Uh, the reason I'm introducing this is one, you'll be able, if you need to have an equation like this when you model this for yourself, uh, if you want to select a material of sorts uh, for process, that's one. Uh, and two, if I do run out of material, what do I do? Uh, and how do I mitigate these, uh, these types of things? So in the office hours, we will discuss ideas about recycling, about reusing uh, materials, uh, and, and what we can do as engineers to sort of save the resources that we have available on Earth. Uh, so uh, think about that, mull over that, and now that we're done with the lecture portion, I want you to refer to the homework uh, section uh, of this, uh, and there are two questions. The first question of the homework uh, deals more with mathematics and specifically this equation. Uh, and then I give you an open-ended uh, answer uh, where you have to look up economic data. Uh, and then the second one is a report question. And you're going to have to develop a report discussing all the concepts that uh, we've discussed today and some more that go into material selection for a product. Uh, and you'll be making a report. Um, and I, I give you uh, the guidelines in the homework. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can always email me. Uh, and uh, also, at the end of this, I wanted to refer to the discussion board question uh, that, I've that I posted on uh, Moodle uh, that deals with the differences between chemical engineers and chemists. Uh, and again, you have to respond to it at least once and then once more to some other students' comment. So a total of two responses. The first response is 300 words at least, whereas the second response uh, is uh, at least two sentences in length. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, lecture, and I will see you all in the office hours.